Welcome at the French Institute. My name is Mathias Rambeau and I'm the head of the book department. We are delighted to have you uh, on site or online for this conversation entitled Napoleon and his legacies on the occasion of the 200th anniversary of his death. Today we have the honor to host Hubert Vedrin, Theodore Zeldin and Laura O'Brien. Hubert Védrine is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, President of the François Mitterrand Institute and Vice President of the Board of the French Institute for International and Strategic Affairs. His latest book is entitled Dictionnaire Amoureux de la Géopolitique and it was published by Plon this year. Theodore Zeldin is a philosopher and a historian he is an Emeritus Fellow and former Dean of St. Anthony's College from the University of Oxford and Professor Honoris Causa at HEC Paris. And Laura O'Brien is Senior Lecturer in Modern European History at Northumbria University. She is currently working on a book about theatrical and cinematic performances of Napoleon in France across the 19th and 20th centuries. And before I leave the floor to her, let me quote these lines from Hubert Vedrin's book. What does history have to say to us? This immense bubbling legacy, endlessly stirred up, in, and stirred up and reinterpreted, exhilarating and horrifying, which can enlighten us as well as imprison us. Well, Let's hope that today's conversation will enlighten us. And Laura, now, if you please. Merci, Mathias. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it is a, a great honor to be here this evening to chair this discussion um, about Napoleon and his legacies, um, marking, as, as Mathias has said, the 200th anniversary of his death on St. Helena on the 5th of May, 1821. And when he died, I think, it was quite a low-key news event. It took a while to travel to Europe. And yet here we are 200 years later, still discussing the meaning and the impact of this man um, in, in European and in global history. So I think I can open the discussion by asking why. Why are we still talking about Napoleon 200 years after his death? And why does Napoleon continue to exert a global fascination um, for so many people? 200 years on. So I will open the, the discussion. Um, Professor Zeldin, maybe you would like to start by responding to that. Yes. Well, Hubert Verdrin has already answered your question, which is that we need uh, to use history to reflect on our present uh, dilemmas and see what we can learn from it so that we do not do what people have done throughout history which is to repeat the same mistakes. And I think therefore the, um, I'm delighted that uh, this um, is a quotation from this new book, which I should very much like to obtain. I might say that um, Hubert Vedrin's book, books, papers, uh, articles, um, figure in the Bodleian Library in Oxford in large numbers. I cannot claim to have read all of them, but I have read quite a few, and I am very interested by his approach and uh, um, by his attitude to what France should be doing. And this is just the context in which I would like this discussion to proceed. That is to say, um, what message can the French draw from their history? And how can they um, contrast it with a message that Britain draws from its history? We have been, the two countries have been um, enemies and sometimes friends, but always in difficulties, um, always um, sometimes, you know, Anglomania in France, but uh, quite often um, insults against the French, um, even by people who have summer houses in France, they still insult the French. And it is time with that we did something more positive out of this. And I'm very keen to do it because 
at the moment, the relations between Britain and France are at a very low ebb and they could get worse. And the Brexit, Brexit has caused us enormous um, violence in that uh, you must remember that only 37% of the British electorate voted for Brexit. And the result was a um, transformation of the idea of democracy in Britain, because um, the members of parliament elected, the majority of them were against Brexit, but they decided to become spokesmen for their electors because they were afraid to vote against Brexit because they would lose their seats. And so instead of having representative government, which has existed in Britain ever since Edmund Burke's time, that the member of parliament is there to say what he thinks, not to obey the instructions of the electorate. So there's been terrific transformation <coughs> in Britain and the whole idea of democratic government is being challenged when international laws are being flouted and ignored. So, um, Mr. Fredrin, I'd like to ask you how you react to this dismay in Britain. Does your historical um, um, experience enable you to say that we are fed up with these quarrels between Britain and France and that we can do something more interesting? I, th I think we can perhaps come back to some of the contemporary ramifications of this, of, of the meaning of this history, I think, um, in, in due course in some of the questions. Um, I think what we don't want to stick to the questions that you have asked. They're excellent questions. But I think we've got to um, incorporate this into a, um, an explanation of what two people on either side of the, of the uh, channel wish to do with these memories. Oh, I completely agree. And I think this is a really powerful moment, actually, to examine Napoleonic legacies in both contexts. And maybe, uh, Monsieur le Ministre, if you could respond to these questions of the, uh, le, 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 the meaning of Napoleon, the le, signification of Napoleon in this moment, why it nous fascine si, uh, si tôt, uh, même deux, deux, deux siècles après sa mort, uh, et sa signification uh, dans le contexte que le professeur Zeldin a, a décrit? Alors, d'abord, je voudrais remercier le professeur Zeldin pour ses propos très aimables. Et je voudrais dire, moi aussi, que je suis très heureux de, de dialoguer avec lui, d'avoir un échange. Euh, surtout vu l'originalité la, la, et la puissance de sa réflexion. Sur Napoléon, je pense que, en fait, c'est le dernier grand conquérant historique dont on peut débattre. On peut être pour ou contre. Si on parlait de Jean Giscan, d'Hannibal, de Tamerlan, de Jules César, d'Alexandre le Grand, c'est passionnant, mais ce n'est pas notre histoire. C'est trop loin, en fait. C'est trop loin. Il n'y a pas de proximité. Après Napoléon, il y a eu Hitler. Personne n'a envie de débattre sur Hitler, en fait. Et personne, va être, on ne va pas dire qu'on est pour ou contre. Donc, Napoléon, on a un exemple fascinant de grands conquérants historiques d'un génie militaire et stratégique qui a incroyablement organisé la France de l'époque. Et en même temps, il y a des, des phases terribles, des aspects négatifs, terrifiants sur Napoléon. Mais on peut débattre, en fait. Donc, je pense que c'est une sorte de lien pour nous entre l'histoire contemporaine, la nôtre, l'histoire moderne jusqu'à maintenant, euh, l'Europe d'aujourd'hui, la Grande-Bretagne, le Brexit, Biden, etc. etc. Et puis, d'autre part, toute l'histoire passée pendant des millénaires. C'est une sorte de charnière pour moi. C'est pour ça qu'on peut se, se passionner sur le cas de Napoléon. D'ailleurs, ce qui est curieux, c'est qu'à vous savez qu'à quelques mois près, il aurait été italien. Puisque la Corse relevait de la ville de Gênes, en fait. Donc le fait que Napoléon soit 
on sait, c'est une sorte de hasard malicieux. Donc ça, c'est une petite parenthèse. En tout cas, voilà pourquoi je pense qu'on peut continuer à en débattre et que ce grand conquérant nous impressionne, nous exalte et nous terrifie en même temps. Alors après, à nous de choisir, vu et nous sommes en 2021, à nous de voir dans ce paquet, dans cet héritage, ce que cela signifie, ce n'est pas la même chose pour les Anglais ou pour les Français ou pour les autres, ou pour les Allemands. Um, first of all, I would, like, I would like to thank Professor Zeldin for the words. I'm really happy to be talking with him today and um, I'm especially debating the originality of his views and ideas. Um, Napoleon was the last historic conqueror um, and we can be for or against him, but it can be a source of debate, unlike Alexander the Great or Genghis Khan or many others who are way too far in history. After Napoleon, there was Hitler, and we do not debate um, Hitler, and we do not say whether we are for or against him. Um, Napoleon was a fascinating military genius, and he organized France in a very specific way at the time, and yet there were terrifying negative aspects to his legacy. But the debate remains possible. Um, and of course, there is a link with contemporary history. Um, of course, um, as an aside, he could very well have ended up being Italian, considering that Corsica was at the time ruled by Genoa. So it was a matter of months, really. Um, and of course, today, in 2021, there is this, this extremely important legacy, which can be seen very differently, whether you are in the UK, France, or Germany, or elsewhere. Um, thank you both for your for your responses. I wonder if maybe we can pick up on maybe this this idea of the of the contemporary image, or maybe the the different perceptions actually of of Napoleon. Um, I think one of the things that has emerged in the bicentenary discussion is the idea that he has only recently become a controversial figure. It's almost as if we have only just discovered the negative sides of the empire, the controversial sides. But as you have said, um, Monsieur Vadim, Monsieur le Ministre. He is someone that we continue to debate. He is perhaps the last of the great kind of historical debates, as you, as you said, pour ou contre. Um, and maybe we could think about how perceptions of Napoleon have changed over time. Um, the, the different faces of Napoleon, the different representations of, of Napoleon that we have encountered and that we continue to encounter. And as you have, uh, as, as, as Monsieur Vetrin has said, these depend very much on national context. So I'd maybe like to draw that out a little bit more. What are the different yes. faces that we have? Well, there have been a large number of speeches and ceremonies um, uh, in honor of, uh, of Napoleon, uh, repeated over the many years, repeated constantly. And it seems that we'd be wasting our time if we're going to repeat the same thing and say, we think he is good this way and bad this way, because we know all this, this is all known. But now there is a big issue going on in the world. And we have to say, what can we learn from all this previous history um, that um, will help us solve our existing problems? We cannot fool around with um, mere um, chronological analysis of what he did. Um, that is, there's plenty of it. And then if you ask, what is the French attitude and what's the British attitude? Well, the French attitude, one is complete disagreement There are people who hate Napoleon. Um, even uh, you know, Jospin has written a book called Le Mal Napoleon. What is, what is this about? Because he is somebody who has done many contradictory things and he is uh, in a very fascinating way. And one, uh, one draws from this that one cannot say that France has a particular attitude to Napoleon or that Britain has a particular attitude. Um, th there are as many attitudes as one can imagine. And I always say that France has as many minorities as it has population. And so how can we get beyond this? Na Napoleon's idea was united, uniting a nation on the basis of nationalism and of military Uh, success and of building a new structure um, to replace the feudal ancien regime. And uh, it seems to me that he um, 
has raised issues, one of which really concerns me very much today. A large number of countries in the world are becoming dictatorships. Napoleon became increasingly authoritarian. Um, what are we going to do? Is it possible? How do we treat this fact that authoritarian governments are now voted for? Napoleon sometimes got elections in which he got 99%. We are now full of dictators getting 99%. What's going wrong? How can we move out of this? What do you think, Mr. Vedrin? How do we get out of, what should we respond to what is happening? Not only it's happening in, as I say, in, in Britain, where only 37% um, voted for a referendum. And I, I personally blame Europe for not saying to it, that is not a proper referendum. You need at least two thirds of the electors to vote. We reject this referendum. Monsieur le ministre, si vous voulez répondre, euh, c'est pour Sur quel point Il y a plusieurs euh, sujets en même temps. Si, si vous voulez commencer, peut-être sur euh, Napoléon et puis euh, peut-être sur les, les, cette question des, les, des leçons de Napoléon euh, dans le, le moment euh, si, euh, si difficile en, en ce moment. You're, you're a great expert on contemporary mm. diplomacy and politics. And you do this in a very... Um, in a very lucid and quiet way without any partisanship and this is what distinguishes your writing it's very original and uh it'd be nice to know how one can go beyond the animosities which um continue to uh bother us with with napoleon and what can we do about this big question which now threatens France, and I read in the papers, all worried about what will happen to the extreme right in the next election. What is the answer? Bon, alors, ce n'est pas évident de, de faire un lien en réalité avec Napoléon. Euh, et donc le début, le début du 19e siècle, après la révolution en France, la révolution de 89, 93, la terreur, le consulat, c'est quand même un, une séquence tout à fait particulière et je ne sais pas si on peut analyser le despotisme de Napoléon qui met un terme au cycle révolutionnaire le plus violent et puis les formes de despotisme dans le monde contemporain. Ce n'est pas évident, enfin, on peut essayer, mais enfin, je, vais dire un, je vais dire quelque chose à ce sujet sur le populisme contemporain. Mais avant, je voudrais dire qu'à mon avis, euh, Monsieur Zeldin l'a rappelé, les Français sont très divisés sur Napoléon. Certains l'admirent de façon fanatique et d'autres le détestent. Et d'autres euh, admirent certaines choses et détestent d'autres. Et beaucoup regrettent qu'il ne se soit pas arrêté en 1808, 1807, 1808. Donc il y a des points de vue assez contrastés. En revanche, je pense que pour les Anglais, il y a un élément commun compte tenu de l'idée que le peuple anglais se fait de lui-même et de ce qu'il a réalisé historiquement, dont l'Empire, ça doit paraître extraordinaire qu'il ait fallu six ou sept énormes coalitions pour vaincre Napoléon. Et pas simplement une seule, vous voyez. Donc il y a quand même un, un défi qui a été lancé au moment où la Grande-Bretagne devenait la puissance numéro un. Donc je pense que ça, ça alimente des réflexions profondes qui sont complètement différentes d'un côté et de l'autre. Alors je vais dire un mot sur le populisme, mais madame, je vais peut-être vous laisser traduire avant pour que ce ne soit pas trop long. There is a, a no easy link between Napoleon and the time uh, in which he, he operated in the early 19th century past the revolutions of, 19, of 1799, 1793, the reign of terror, the consulate. Um, and can we really analyze the, his kind of de despotism that put an end to one of the most violent periods in the history of France with today's situation? 
Um, obviously, as, as Professor Zeldin has said, France is very divided at the moment. Some are extremely for uh, Napoleon, some hate him, some like some aspects of what he did and hate some others, but many regret that he didn't stop um, in 1807, 1808. Um, as regards the British, uh, there is this, considering the idea of um, the, the British people regarding what they achieved, in other words, the building of, of an empire, um, they may find extraordinary that it took several coalitions to get rid of Napoleon, in fact, and it, it challenges the, the, their way of thinking. And I would like to speak a little bit about populism, but uh, we'll get to that. Alors, j'ajoute deux remarques. Deux remarques, mais il faut se méfier de l'anachronisme. Dès qu'on parle d'histoire, on est en plein anachronisme. Et le regard change parce que justement, on fait des reconstructions du passé qui changent tout le temps, qui sont toutes fausses historiquement, mais qui, et qui nous disent quel est la, le regard en 1900, 1900, 2000, 2010, etc. Attention donc. Alors, ce qui peut se comparer un peu, à mon avis, c'est que même maintenant, dans tous les pays qui ont connu le chaos, le chaos, le désordre, évidemment la guerre civile, comme c'était le cas en France, bon, mais aussi l'appauvrissement. Par exemple, quand l'Union soviétique s'est effondrée, les Russes ont perdu 40% de leur pouvoir d'achat en, en, en 10 ans. 40%, pas 1 ou 2%, 40%. Donc chaque fois qu'il y a des situations historiques de ce type, autrefois comme aujourd'hui, il y a une aspiration vers un pouvoir fort en fait, qui rétablit l'ordre. Les peuples ont une sorte de haine absolue du chaos, ils ont peur du chaos. Alors après, quelle forme de despotisme Est-ce que c'est un totalitarisme, un simple despotisme, carrément une dictature Ça dépend, ça dépend. Donc là, on peut tenter des comparaisons avec la France à la fin de la Révolution. Là où, à mon avis, on ne peut pas comparer, c'est que ce qu'on appelle le populisme dans le monde d'aujourd'hui, en fait, c'est le sous-produit de la mondialisation et de l'intégration européenne, qui toutes les deux auraient pu être conduites de façon raisonnable, en n'agressant pas trop les peuples, et qui ont été conduites de façon forcée, on va dire, forcée. Donc, au bout d'un moment, les classes populaires ont décroché, en disant « c'est mauvais pour nous », et puis les classes moyennes. Donc au bout d'un moment, ça donne euh, Trump, ça donne le Brexit, ça donne l'AFD en Allemagne, et Marine Le Pen en France, et Mélenchon en France, etc. Mais ça n'a rien à voir avec les années 30, par exemple, à mon avis. C'est complètement différent. C'est donc un décrochage qui aurait pu avoir lieu quand même, être beaucoup moins fort. Alors là, je pense que les, les questions euh, auxquelles notre monde est confronté, n'ont absolument rien à voir avec la, ce qui se passait en 1800, ni en France, ni en Angleterre. Vous voyez, donc je distingue les deux. Par contre, l'aspiration à, à un régime, disons à l'autorité, qui rétablit l'ordre et la sécurité, je pense que c'est présent dans tous les peuples. Ça. Donc il faut, faut faire attention quand ce besoin s'exprime. Yes, I, I agree we should um, really be aware of anachronism when we talk about history because we reconstruct the past, we reanalyze the past with hindsight and they can become a, a false point of view from a historical perspective. Um, however, it tells us what we thought of the situation at the time. Um, uh, all countries that uh, know chaos at one point in their history, civil war, be it impoverishment, Um, for instance, um, you know, I want, for example, uh, the, the spending power of Russia, which fell by 40% in a matter of years after the revolution, um, gives way to an aspiration for strong power, for, for uniting power, for something that will re-establish uh, um, stability and, and, and will give uh, chaos. Of course, what type can that power be? That is the, the actual question. Um, and so, from that perspective, we can analyze France's post-revolution situation with Napoleon. However, uh, we should be aware of actually comparing it with populism today, because populism today is a product, a byproduct of globalization or of integration within Europe. 
Um, it could have been led in a very reasonable and slow way, but it was led in too forced a way. And the result was that the working classes became disenfranchised. And um, this in turn, in turn gave uh, rise to Brexit, to extremism, to Mélenchon, Le Pen. Um, and that's very, very different from what we are looking at, which was the, 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 big, the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, however, when it comes to this aspiration for authority, for power, I believe it is present everywhere. We just need to just be clear when we analyze it. Yes, I, I agree with you that these forms of um, dictatorship and authoritarianism are all different in each period. But all of them are varieties of authoritarianism and the willingness of large populations to accept the rule of one man who decides. I'm not saying this has anything to do with Napoleon was like that. Napoleon um, was successful for was a, was popular for many reasons with many people because he offered them something which they valued and admired. Um, but what we are talking about now, we're talking about why is it that a country like the USA can have half its population say they are willing to hand over control of their fate to one person. And this therefore raises the question of what what can we what do we think of democracy in nations today i'm not saying that there is there is a similarity you see i i treat history as a provocation of the imagination what not what just what happened what could have happened what else could happen what can we do to avoid falling into similar not identical similar um difficulties and disasters and uh when a uh, when as i since i feel so strongly that uh, britain um who uh, which finally defeated napoleon but which um therefore regards him as a menace um and uh now that europe is um behaving with some vigor against britain's demands to change the its treaties um this animosity is increasing what i really want to know from you is what do you offer the large number of people in britain who admire france for whom france is an essential part of all civilizations um that it is uh, uh that you cannot um, understand the contribution of France and they should speak its language and in Britain we are abolishing very rapidly the study of foreign languages and there are very few people who are studying I think it's about five percent of our school children are studying French now this I think is a disaster so what can you offer that section I'm not saying what you should do with the governments can you distinguish between the two Um, I think maybe we can pick up on this by thinking about what um, Monsieur, Ved Monsieur Vedrine has said about historical anachronism. And I think in this present moment, as Professor Zeldin has said, the animosities that are increasing, or the perceived animosities, I think, that are increasing between Britain, France, and Europe, sometimes evoke, sometimes the people who are in involved in, in driving on these animosities evoke memories of the Napoleonic Wars and use things like references to Waterloo, references to Trafalgar, in a historically anachronistic, in a historically anachronistic sense. Um, but I think the sort of, what, what I always find quite interesting is that you can have people who are completely fascinated by French history and by the Napoleonic story in Britain, who may not necessarily agree with the policies of, of, of Europe as well. Um, and I think this kind of historic, question of historical anachronism is, is quite important. Um, I think this also brings us to the question of the political uses of history. Um, and that might bring us back, I think, to the to the bicentenary, even though we try to avoid historical anachronism, and as a historian, this is something I feel quite strongly about, um, political regimes have always tried to use the past to send a message to the present, to, to, to send a particular political message. 
are there ways perhaps, and maybe, maybe Monsieur Vedrin can, can speak to this um, from the French perspective, are there ways in which perhaps the, the bicentenary of Napoleon has been used in a political sense in France, or has it been stripped of political significance? Maybe if we think perhaps of what President Macron was saying at the Institut de France on the 5th of May in his, in his, his discours on, on Napoleon. Um, has it been used politically, or, or has it been stripped of the political um, significance in the, in the bicentenary year? We think of these big political questions that we've been discussing so far. C'est un, c'est une discussion sans fin. <laughs> D'abord, je suis très sensible à ce qu'a dit Monsieur Zeldin sur le quand il regrette les le tout petit chiffre des Anglais qui apprennent le français aujourd'hui. Alors là, si on parle à l'époque de Napoléon, hein, on est à partir de Louis XIV et jusqu'au début du XXe siècle. Le français est la langue des élites du monde entier de l'époque, c'est-à-dire de l'Europe. Tous les dirigeants parlent en français. C'est-à-dire la reine d'Angleterre actuelle encore parle un très bon français. Et le changement, c'est quand Clémenceau accepte que le traité de Versailles soit rédigé dans deux langues. Parce qu'il avait vécu aux États-Unis, il avait une femme américaine. Donc le changement commence en 1918. Bon, quand on est à l'époque de Napoléon, la question ne se pose même pas, en fait. Même pas. Bon, donc là, en effet, il faut éviter l'anachronisme. Mais on a abordé pas mal de, de thèmes à la fois, là. Je voudrais redire un mot sur les démocraties. Alors, je pense que euh, la question de la démocratie se pose aujourd'hui, mais euh, on ne va pas trouver la réponse à nos questions en étudiant les despotismes du passé, en fait qui arrivent dans des conditions pas tellement étonnantes et qui sont des despotismes effrayants ou éclairés, ça dépend des cas. Je pense que la, la démocratie aujourd'hui dans nos pays, en général, est beaucoup plus menacée pour des raisons internes qu'externes. Je veux dire par là que, euh, évidemment, il y a des manœuvres russes, c'est évident, qu'il y a une sorte d'arrogance chinoise nouvelle, une sorte d'hubris de la Chine. Bien sûr, on ne peut pas nier ça. Mais à mon avis, la menace principale, elle est interne. Les peuples démocratiques d'aujourd'hui, très informés, ultra informés, qui peuvent comparer tout le temps, qui peuvent communiquer sans arrêt, ils ne croient plus du tout aux promesses politiques. Mais ça ne met pas plusieurs années pour arriver dans leur tête. Ils peuvent tout à fait voter pour quelqu'un le dimanche et être furieux trois jours après. Et donc, il y a quelque chose qui est très, très frappant en France. Je ne sais pas si c'est aussi fort chez vous. Peut-être pas. C'est que la démocratie représentative est de plus en plus contestée dans son principe. Le mouvement des Gilets jaunes en France, par exemple, ne voulait avoir aucun représentant. Donc, c'était une, une aspiration à la démocratie directe, instantanée. Pas de représentant. Et on a tout un système qui, à mon avis, est devenu euh, totalement fou, qui ont les démocraties ingouvernables, avec les réseaux sociaux qui vont dans le sens de l'hystérie, donc l'information permanente, donc les médias, etc., etc. Donc je pense que ça devient progressivement euh, presque impossible de gouverner les démocraties modernes à cause de la contestation de la représentation. Alors la réponse à ça, c'est de dire il faut convaincre les gens que la démocratie est plus juste, mais surtout que c'est un système efficace. Mais qu'est-ce que ça veut dire, le système efficace Est-ce que vous avez des demandes extraordinaires, euh, presque impossibles à satisfaire, alors que les pays européens sont les pays les plus riches et les plus heureux de toute l'histoire de l'humanité Même si les gens sont furieux toute la journée, c'est une évidence, vous voyez Donc il y a une sorte d'engrenage, et le, à mon avis, le vrai défi de la démocratie, c'est ça c'est reconvaincre les populations d'aujourd'hui de la formule de Churchill. Vous vous rappelez, bien sûr, la démocratie, c'est le meilleur système à l'exception de tous les autres. On croyait que les gens avaient compris. Non, ils n'ont pas compris. Et d'ailleurs, Churchill avait ajouté une autre phrase que j'ai en tête. La seule chose qui peut faire douter de la démocratie, c'est cinq minutes de conversation avec un électeur moyen. Donc voilà le, 
le défi, à mon avis, pour les démocraties aujourd'hui, il est interne et il n'y a aucune solution dans le passé, même pas dans Tocqueville. Donc, on est obligé d'inventer quelque chose. It is an endless debate. Um, and yes, whilst I re regret the, the, the very small number of language learners that Professor Zeldin evoked, um, we've got to remember that at the time French was the language of the elite. In other words, all of Europe, um, the, the leaders, and in fact today still the Queen speaks very, very good uh, French. It was only in 1918 that Clemenceau agreed that the Treaty of Versailles should be written in both languages, and that's largely because he had an American wife. Uh, at the time of Napoleon, there was no question of that. Um, we've discussed many themes, but I would like to go back to the theme of democracies. Um, there is no answer in studying um, what the past despotisms, whether enlightened or terrifying, brought us. Um, our democracies today seem threatened by internal reasons, mostly um, despite um, Russian maneuvers, despite Chinese hubris. Um, the populations are ultra informed, they compare, they contrast constantly, they no longer believe uh, in the political promises of their leaders, and that can change day to day. Um, as a matter of fact, the representative idea of democracy is, is contested. If we look at the Gilets Jaunes, the Yellow Vest uh, movement, they refused representation. They wanted a direct form of democracy, which for them embodied a modern type of democracy, which ultimately was ungovernable. Um, and it was related by social media, which made matters even worse. So to me, the answer and most likely the challenge uh, would be to convince people that democracy can be efficient. Um, despite the fact that you know European countries are, are, are at their happiest in history, um, they still uh, have demands that are constantly impossible to satisfy. Um, and on the theme of democracy, actually, I do remember two quotes by, by, by Churchill saying that democracy is the best system except for all others. And that if you ever wanted to stop doubting democracy, you just had to have a five minute conversation with the average voter. I think this question of I think the question of the the perhaps lack of trust in representative democracy. While I, I completely agree with Le Ministre with this idea that we we cannot keep looking back to the past and saying this is this is just like that situation. Um, on some level, it does for me as a historian of, of of modern France evoke questions of the plebiscitary system emerging under the first empire and then really put in force in the second, used particularly prominently in the second, while at the same time, so a strong belief in referenda, while at the same time there is a demise to a certain extent in the, in the representative democracy of um, the Assemblée Nationale and, and, and so on. Um, and I was wondering though if this question is to bring people back to believing in representative democracy I suppose as a historian, I'm asking this question because I want to feel like we have some utility, some use in the, in the current world. What are the lessons that we might be able to present from history to, to show that representative democracy is the way forward, is, as, 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 as you've cited Churchill, is the, the best system out of all the others? Um, what, what maybe can we take from the contested chaos of the the 18th and 19th centuries to show that representative democracy still has importance and significance? Well, I don't think that one can convince people to believe something that they don't want to believe. And if you do convince them, quite often they will believe something different from what you have convinced them to believe. So my, I would answer to this that yes, one can find something which um, provides an answer, and I'd like to see Mr. Bedrin's uh, response to it. At the moment, it seems to me there is no consensus in most countries. People, when we talk about French values or British values, these, we do not share all the same values. Um, we are, in fact, we disagree very strongly with our um, fellow citizens in our own country. And I think, therefore, if you take what people believe in and what people are seeking for, you will not get one answer in each nation. And therefore, these values now seem to me to reproduce religion. When Britain was torn between uh, Catholic and Protestant, um, 
and, and non-conformist and so on. Um, what, the, what developed is quite separate groups within the nations. And democracy is one form of, you might say, religion, belief, and autocracy is another, and uh, Trumpism is another. And perhaps we should accept that, and that's, that's the, real, the real question I'm, I'm interested in, I'm trying to get out of you and you're resisting. <laughs> Um, I'm trying to get out of you. Can one get from France an acceptance that even though the government has taken these particular Brexit lines, um, there are lots of people who have different values and who feel that their lives have been seriously damaged by being shut off from Europe. This has been a very strong blow to us. And if you treat that as a religion, can you say that there is room for um, some kind of interaction, some kind of welcome for the Francophiles in Britain? You see, at the moment, we are, you're either a citizen of France or you're not a citizen of France, or a citizen of Europe and you're not. But there are these intermediaries which, are, which religion goes over across national boundaries. And values are now going across national values. What do you think? Monsieur Vetrin, si vous voulez répondre à cette proposition des, des religions, des, des religions politiques, en fait. Alors, je ne sais pas si j'ai compris toutes les nuances, mais je crois avoir compris l'essentiel. Le, euh, D'abord, il a raison de dire que il n'y a plus beaucoup de pays dans lesquels il n'y a, a plus de consensus. En France, c'est typique, regardez le mot de république que les Français emploient tout le temps, toute la journée. On, il n'y a pas de consensus sur le contenu, vous voyez. Donc le, le langage politique est d'ailleurs absolument rempli de, de ce qu'on appelle en français les mots valises. Je ne sais pas s'il y a le même mot en anglais pour dire les, les mots qui ont plein de sens si on ne sait pas quel et leur sens exact. Un peu comme quand les gens croient qu'il y a une communauté internationale, vous voyez, il n'y en a pas en fait. Donc il y a plein de mots valises comme ça qui embrouillent la pensée. Donc il n'y a pas de consensus et il y a toutes sortes de batailles. Et il me semble que la, si la démocratie n'est pas, si c'est un mécanisme, un mécanisme de discussion et de sélection des dirigeants et de choix de la politique, à peu près tout le monde peut s'y retrouver. Si la démocratie devient une religion parmi d'autres, euh, on le voit très bien que la question de l'islamisme, je ne parle pas de l'islam en général, mais on voit bien que dans l'islam, il y a eu une sorte de révolution ces dernières décennies. Il y a une branche de l'islam qui s'est réislamisée, avec des théories complètement différentes, ce qui entraîne des luttes féroces dans à peu près chaque pays arabe. Vous voyez Bon, donc, s'il y a plusieurs religions en, en concurrence, le pronostic est inquiétant. Et on voit bien en France, par exemple, que sur les questions de, ben, par exemple, de migratoire, je prends cet exemple, mais parmi d'autres, mais ça pourrait porter sur l'éducation, ça peut porter sur l'exercice de l'autorité, ça peut porter sur euh, quelle doit être la, la place de la France dans l'Europe de demain une question que les Anglais ont tranchée de façon brutale, que beaucoup d'Anglais regrettent, mais qui est d'une certaine façon tranchée. Ce qui n'est pas le cas en France. Alors que je pense qu'il n'y a, a pas le débat en Allemagne, il n'y a pas de débat comparable en Allemagne sur le consensus. Peut-être parce que les Allemands ont peur d'eux-mêmes, c'est possible. Vous voyez Puis Je ne parle même pas des États-Unis où... Quel est le consensus aux États-Unis aujourd'hui Dans le meilleur des cas, il y a, il y a deux peuples différents. Peut-être beaucoup plus. Alors, si c'est arrivé dans un monde où on est seul, où les pays occidentaux peuvent poursuivre leur, 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 leur histoire personnelle, leur recherche philosophique, très bien, il n'y aurait pas de problème, ce serait très très intéressant. Un peu comme des cités grecques les unes par rapport aux autres, 
en oubliant la guerre du Péloponnèse, bien sûr. Bon. Mais on n'est pas dans ce monde-là. On est dans un monde où il y a toujours la Russie, il y a la Chine de plus en plus, il y a le Moyen-Orient qui est immaîtrisable. Donc moi, je, il me semble qu'il y a une grande crise philosophique presque de civilisation dans les démocraties, à un moment où elles sont quand même concurrencées de façon dure, en tout cas mises sous pression. Mais je ne pense pas qu'il puisse y avoir une réponse globale à ça. Il n'y a pas de réponse démocratique globale. Il peut y avoir la reconstruction d'un consensus britannique, peut-être, d'un consensus français, peut-être. Mais j'aimerais bien qu'il y ait les deux. So, yes, I would agree that there is no more consensus. Um, if we take, for instance, the term republic in France, it mean a variety of things. Um, and, and those words that mean everything and, and anything end up being misnomers, just like when we talk about international community, there is no such thing. Um, if we think of the mechanism of discussion, of selection of leaders, of choice, then we're going to accept the term of democracy. Um, but if, if we look at it from the point of view of a religion, uh, if we look, for instance, at Islamism, which I um, use as a significantly different word from Islam, um, which causes uh, the, the ferocious fights within each of the, the, the countries because there are new theories, new ways of seeing things, a new politicized way of seeing things. Um, if we start seeing these different religions in competition, then it becomes very worrying. Um, we, we can see that with you know, migration policies, we can see that, of course, with the place of France within the, the, the EU, um, of course, with the UK, it was dealt with. It was dealt with harshly, but as it has been done. Um, there is no such debate in, in Germany, for instance. Maybe they're afraid of themselves. Um, as for consensus, consensus in, the U, in the US, well, we can say there are two separate populations there, maybe even more. Um, if we if we have countries that can continue on their path from a from a political from a philosophical perspective um ignoring others and a bit like greek cities then then that's okay um, but of course today we have russia we have china we have the middle east and uh, i do believe there is a major crisis of civilization from a, a philosophical philosophical point of view within the democracies um and these democracies are under extreme pressure so i don't think there is a global answer i would think that there's a possibility of rebuilding British consensus or French consensus, and I truly hope that both will happen. Well, I'm glad to see that you um, recognize the gravity of the crisis of um, opinion and uh, which, which one doesn't see as disappearing very quickly or disappear, and I think increasing. And when you mention Islam, I would say that there are many varieties of Islam. There is no agreement within Islam that will be, and that happens in all religions. And so the, the great achievement of the 18th century, 19th century in France, 19th century, was to find some kind of pacification of religious disagreement. And but we need to go one stage further. We need to develop an art of disagreement. At the moment we uh, tolerate other nation, other religions um, in order not have any trouble from them. But we do not, we are not interested in those religions. We do not discuss with them their problems and their problems are often quite related to our own problems. And that is why I am interested in the development of conversations between people who disagree and i've done a lot of experiments with this which have produced remarkable results of people who on politics may disagree on other subjects find each other interesting because um, my response to what you're, you've been saying is that like napoleon napoleon believed them was to find political solutions saying um, we mustn't uh, um, we must break with the ancient idea of fate that this is the way the world is we must find political solutions but political social solutions have not yet solved this question 
and uh, um, I see therefore a bit new way of um, looking at um, the, the world population, not in terms of nationality, but in terms of individuals, each individual being an enigma and a different and unique and um, capable of being interested in why other people are different from themselves and in these conversations which which i've experimented with people say in the process of talking with somebody different they uh, learn something about themselves as well as about another person and i see this as a the, if you ask what is the purpose of life now purpose of life of course is always the, the desire to continue life to reproduce life but it's also to discover life. We are just on the process of beginning to understand what life is um, scientifically, medically, and uh, in terms of um, animals and plants and uh, the number, amount of new information about what is life like is absolutely staggering. And uh, I would like us to see, therefore, that when we talk about uh, climate change. We don't say just we're going to change, the, improve the climate, we're going to have a certain temperature. Because are we then going to go on fighting and quarreling and having wars when we have the perfect temperature? I feel like on some level, I think Napoleon will be quite interested in this discussion of the, the, the natural world. I think I've been reading um, Ruth Skur's new biography where she talks about him as this person that could have been a naturalist had he not not entered the military and the, had he been accepted on, um, on an expedition, I think it's quite an interesting comparison. I do want to um, maybe bring us back to this question, to the central question, because, because you have evoked this, this idea of achievement, um, Professor Zeldin, the achievement of the 18th century, the achievements of the 19th century. And that brings me back to the question of, of legacy. Um, because on, on some level, I think we are still dealing with the world, the shape of the world, the shape of the political systems that were created in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries, obviously with, with changes. And many of these came out of the experience of Napoleonic Europe, um, the breakdown of Napoleonic Europe, the restructuring of Europe, the, the reaction against Napoleon in both Europe and um, elsewhere in the world, particularly in the Caribbean, for example. What are the legacies of that time? Now, I'm not asking for you know, a comparison with the world then and now. But if we were to say what the, the main legacies that we are still dealing with from that time period, what are they? Is it this question of contested democracy? Is the question of consensus or is it something different entirely? Is it the political system that we work within? Well, one of the things which I would blame universities for is in the way they teach history and uh, they teach it as a collection of facts and our Minister of Education at one time said, the important thing is that every schoolboy, school child should remember the, all the names of all the kings of England, which is completely useless. They don't introduce any philosophy, any thinking into, into uh, historical study. History is, is a process of reflecting on all human behavior in all civilizations. And uh, so uh, the legacy each person usually has very, knows various an anecdotes, which are not of much use. Um, but uh, I'd like Mr. Bedwin to, uh, to hear his comment. I think as a, as, a, as a historian, I think for me as well, I think we have in universities, I think we have changed that. I think, I think what is reassuring for me is that young people are really interested, not just in the facts now, but in the whys and the hows and the philosophies, as you said. So that is quite reassuring. Monsieur Védrine, si vous voulez répondre à cette question de, des grands legs, des, des, de, les choses les plus significatives euh, qui, nous, euh, qui nous vivons euh, avec en ce moment de, 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 de l'époque napoléonienne, de, de, de l'époque révolutionnaire et, et après Écoutez, en ce qui concerne la France, il y a une partie de ce que Napoléon a organisé qui était une synthèse extraordinaire entre une partie de l'Ancien Régime, certains acquis de la Révolution et la porte de Napoléon, et une partie de ça qui est encore en place. 
mais de moins en moins quand même. Enfin, ça a structuré la France pendant deux siècles. Ça, c'est pour la France. Euh, pour le reste, le paradoxe, c'est ce qui a duré le plus, c'est l'organisation de l'Europe après Napoléon. Parce que les Anglais ont fini par vaincre Napoléon. Au bout de la, je sais quoi, septième ou huitième coalition. Et donc, c'est ce qui a été organisé au Congrès de Vienne, qui est très important. Au Congrès de Vienne, grâce à l'Angleterre, à la Prusse, la Russie et l'Autriche, avec votre grand ministre, je ne sais pas exactement comment on prononce, Castelrig, comment on prononce exactement bon, Les Anglais disent « nous Castel... sommes les meilleurs ». On dit toujours « nous sommes les meilleurs, nous avons gagné la bataille ». Oui, mais alors, euh... Henri, c'est vrai que l'organisation du Congrès de Vienne a fait fonctionner le, le système européen quasiment jusqu'en 1914. Et Bismarck ne l'a pas détruit, c'est Guillaume II qui l'a détruit, pas Bismarck. Donc là, le leg le plus extraordinaire, c'est le leg de la coalition anti-Napoléon. Je suis obligé de dire ça en fait. Même si la, la fascination de Napoléon a continué, parce que c'est un conquérant et un stratège totalement exceptionnel. Totalement exceptionnel. En revanche, pour tout ce qui concerne l'organisation des sociétés, que nous avons dit sur les démocraties, enfin, tous les problèmes d'aujourd'hui, hein, en Occident, pas en Chine, mais en Occident. Là, c'est quand même très difficile de comparer parce qu'on est dans un monde qui est totalement individualiste. Il y a une sorte d'individualisme forcené, forcené, même si les gens appartiennent à des groupes, à des tribus, à des partis, etc. L'individualisme est quand même la marque, la, la, la marque de l'Occident contemporain. Et donc, on a été au bout de ce que Tocqueville avait craint, avait redouté. Donc là, je pense que c'est presque impossible de tirer des leçons dans ce domaine. Et il faut inventer. Par contre, sur l'organisation, genre congrès de Vienne, y compris avec des éléments de multilatéralisme de l'époque. Par exemple, l'organisation de la navigation sur le Rhin ou sur le Danube, des choses comme ça. Là, il y a beaucoup à beaucoup à apprendre. Mais évidemment, des partisans fanatiques de Napoléon ne seraient pas d'accord. Moi, je ne suis ni un opposant fanatique, ni un partisan fanatique. Oui. Je suis là. Je suis entre les deux. Si nous considérons la France, Napoléon, bien sûr, a organisé la France in in ways that are still partly in place. He took part from the, the, the old regime, he took parts from the revolution, and of course there is his own legacy. And he structured France for nearly two centuries. As for the rest, um, the organization of Europe, um, of course, after the British vanquished uh, Napoleon, and everything that came out of the Congress of Vienna, um, which made the system of Europe that lasted until 1914. That's another story. And William II William um, destroyed it. It was not Bismarck. Um, what's amazing, uh, and we can take out of this, is the coalition anti-Napoleon, against Napoleon. Um, as far as the organization of society, we've talked about democracy and all the Western problems, that's really hard to compare because um, We live in an incredibly uh, individualistic world um, in the, the Western world today, and therefore we cannot really draw lessons with them, only invent. Um, but when it comes from when it comes to to the legacy, of course, there's all the multilateralism that we uh, associate with with that period. Lots to learn from, from everything that structured the world, from, for instance, in navigation on, on on rivers such as the the, the Rhine or the Danube. Um, of course, fanatical partisans of Napoleon might disagree, but I'm neither a partisan for or against him, I'm really in between. I think, yeah, that's what an interesting question, the idea that, yes, the great legacy is that reshaping of, of Europe that we did live with for, for a century, although I think I always find it interesting that if you go to, to the Waterloo site, there are far more Napoleon souvenirs available in the shop than there are Wellington or Blucher souvenirs, but that's another question. Um, we do have a question um, from the audience that's joining us online, and I think it's quite a provocative question. Um, it's, they've asked, we're commemorating the 200th anniversary of Napoleon's death. Will we be talking about him in 100 years? I don't think any of us will, but maybe the, the generation to come. What do you think? Will we be talking about him in 
2121. Well, uh, we historians, we have, can't predict anything. And whatever is predicted will turn out differently. So the answer is don't know. Monsieur le Ministre, vous savez. J'ai eu un, un message entre temps. Redites-moi votre question. Euh, nous parlons de Napoléon ici euh, en 2021. Est-ce que nous euh, allons parler de Napoléon en 2120 ans, en, en, en 100, ans, 100 ans de plus, en, dans un siècle de plus Ou est-ce que nous, nous allons euh, lui euh, oublier complètement Non, on ne peut pas l'oublier complètement. On ne peut pas l'oublier, mais l'exercice va devenir de plus en plus difficile quand même, de faire le lien. Vous voyez, par exemple, on peut discuter en France sur Jules César. Quand Jules César a déclenché la guerre des Gaules, est-ce que ça correspondait à un besoin de sécurité pour l'Empire romain ou est-ce que c'était uniquement un calcul politique personnel Est-ce que c'était une guerre obligée ou une guerre choisie, comme on dit en anglais Bon, On peut débattre entre historiens, mais ça n'a aucune conséquence pratique. Sauf si on constate que, euh, déjà, il y a une partie des Gaulois qui s'étaient alliés à César contre Vercingétorix. Donc, on peut, ça peut alimenter des réflexions sur euh, l'absence de cohésion nationale. Mais c'est des débats historiques qui n'ont aucun rapport avec notre, euh, notre monde. Je pense que quand, euh, quand en France, on aura, disons, réformé, réformé, transformé, oui. Presque toutes les structures héritées de Napoléon, le débat va devenir complètement euh, historique mais abstrait en fait. Et quand on aura réinventé un système mondial de coexistence pacifique entre des systèmes différents, occidental, russe, chinois, etc., on sera dans autre chose. Et comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, on sera plutôt dans le congrès de Vienne que dans les conquêtes napoléoniennes. Et moi, je ne souhaite pas qu'il y ait un Napoléon contemporain, en fait. Est-ce qu'il ne serait pas européen Certainement pas. Je ne sais pas d'où il viendrait, mais il ne serait pas européen. <rire> Donc, il faut que ça nous inspire, sans arrêt. C'est un échange très excitant, mais il ne faut pas que ça nous emprisonne. Bien sûr, nous ne pouvons pas oublier lui, nous ne pouvons pas oublier lui. Comme le temps passe, vous allez définitivement oublier lui. Um, for instance, we can discuss Julius Caesar in the War of the Wall. Um, was that a need for security or was it a choice uh, of his own, for his own advancement? Um, of course, if we look at the fact that some of the Gauls uh, rebelled against uh, Vercingetorix and went with Julius Caesar, we can see an absence of national cohesion. But that's no connection with our world. Um, when France will have restructured all the institutions, all the systems that form the legacy of, of Napoleon, then the debate will probably die down. Um, when we talk about Pacific co coexistence again, uh, among countries, then we're more in the, in the spectrum of the Congress of Vienna rather than the conquests of Napoleon. Um, if there ever is another um, conqueror like this, another Napoleon, he would probably not be European. I don't think he would be. And, um, you know, we must, it must inspire us, but we will not necessarily be debating him in the same way. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. I think um, I I had, earlier I was rereading um, Macron's speech from, from the 5th of May, and one of the things he said was, il faut regarder notre histoire en face, c'est un bloc. We need to look at our history face on and as a block. And I think that's something that we've tried to do this evening, thinking about it as a, not as a, an either or question, but as something that we can learn from, process, think about in these big philosophical challenges, um, existential challenges that we're facing in the world at the moment. Um, but of course, avoiding anachronism and sort of erroneous comparisons, um, erroneous comparisons as well. For my part, I do hope we are talking about Napoleon in a hundred years time um, as well. But for, for now, um, I will finish the discussion here. Thank you very much, um, Professor Theodore Zeldin. Um, and thank you very much, Monsieur Hubert Vedrine. And thank you very much to the audience. Merci à toutes et à tous. Au revoir. Voilà. Well, well Mr. Vedrine, it's 